G'day, Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series and welcome to another episode in our 4x4 trip preparation series. Today what I thought we'd talk about is refrigeration, keeping your food cool for that next big adventure. And this is something that's really critical out here in the Western Australian outback. So anyway, if this sounds like a video that might be of interest to you, then you know what to do. Stay tuned. Rightio, so this is what it's all about. Not the crank handle, we'll leave that for later on. But this is my fridge. I've had this for about five years and it's been on many adventures as you can see. Uh, it's got little splots of SAE 90 gear oil over it. It's got plenty of red dust and it's certainly done a pretty good job. Uh, pretty happy with it, does everything I need it to do. It is a 35 litre fridge, which some people here in Western Australia and Australia might consider it to be a little bit too small. But for me, it does everything I need, as I said. Now, this is what we call a single zone. So basically, the fridge itself has one particular area where we can keep everything cool or frozen. Dual zone, in these more modern Fandango fridges, you have the ability of having one acting as a freezer, one acting as a fridge, or you can have them both as a fridge, both as a freezer. It's entirely up to you. Now, one of the first things I do when I'm going to go out bush for a while or on an adventure, is I look at how long I'm going for. Is it four days, a week, a month? And if so, what are the chances I have of actually being able to get supplies out in that part of the world? Now, if I'm going to obviously a remote location, setting up a base camp for a month straight, which I did in January and I've done many times before for other work, then I'll look at things a bit differently. If it's three or four days and I'm going to be visiting a couple of towns, then that changes things too. Now, I know what you're thinking, how does it, Jeff? Well, I'm going to explain. If we're just going to be hitting a town every couple of days, maybe three, four, five at the most, then we can probably just use this as a refrigerator. If we're going out for a month or so, then we're probably going to want to freeze the produce that we're going to be taking with us. And we're going to obviously want to pack the fridge a lot more delicately than we would on a shorter trip. We want to try and maximise the volume or the space within the fridge also. So for a longer trip, the first thing I do, if I can get it out, <laughs> fantastic I did, is I take out the, the humble little cage that a lot of fridges have in them. Now, you might think that's a bit odd, but it does actually make the volume in the fridge slightly bigger and slightly easier to pack. The other thing I look at is, what do I want to put in here? Now, I have to admit, I really do like a good old chunk of steak or a good old chunk of meat or a good roast. So usually if I'm going out bush for a month or so, I'll go and get, or sorry, I'll go and put an order in with the local butcher and I'll make sure that all my cuts of meat are vacuum packed or cryvacked. The reason why I don't do it myself is the industrial version of the vacuum pack machine or the cryvac uh, has a lot more get up and go than the humble little versions that we can buy to obviously do the same process at home. This means that by going to the butcher and getting them to do it, they can actually get more air actually out of the bag and obviously make a better seal. And that's obviously what we want to do. We want to restrict the meat or whatever produce it may be from interacting with the air in the atmosphere because that obviously speeds up the bacteria that's present and that obviously breaks down the food much quicker. So that's the whole point behind that. Once that's done, I will then actually put it in the deep freezer at home for a couple of days and put it in there until it's virtually like a brick. Now, because these cuts of meat, majority of them, come out and they're almost like a wafer or like a tablet, 
uh, I can basically get them and then just simply stack them in the fridge. Or sorry, I'd be using it as a freezer, stack them in the freezer. Now, before I do that, there's another thing we need to consider, how to use it efficiently. Now, the way I do it, and I'm not saying I'm right here, but I'm just sharing it with you, is I always pack the fridge first in the car. And I'm lucky enough that I have a shed and it's secure, so I can put the vehicle in the shed or the Land Rover in the shed, and then I'll actually plug this into mains power. And I'll do that about a day or so before I actually leave. That means the fridge has got a good chance of getting down to the desired temperature that I want it to be at, particularly if I'm wanting to freeze stuff. So generally I'll set this on about minus 10 or lower if need be, and that will basically have everything icy hot inside or icy cold, depending on how you want to look at it. Anyway, so that means by doing that, I'm not actually going to drain the battery system inside the vehicle. And they always run much better on mains power than they do on 12 volt, I tend to find. So I've got the fridge down to the right temperature. I've got all my produce frozen. I put the frozen produce into the fridge or the freezer. And basically when I do that, I wanna pack it jam packed tight. And the reason why I wanna do that is because I wanna minimize the surface area, right? If you have, for example, the Esky or the Icebox is a great example. If you get a bag of ice and it's all tiny little individual cubes and you open the bag and you put it in the Esky or the Icebox, it's actually going to melt a lot quicker than if you keep it as one big chunk. It's exactly the same with your food. If you virtually jam pack all your meat in there, dairy products, your kale, whatever else you want in there, that's cryovac and frozen, I don't think you'd want to freeze kale, but anyway, maybe you can. Um, you're going to find that it actually has a smaller surface area. And because it's already frozen, the fridge itself or the freezer itself is just trying to maintain the temperature. By putting warm food in there, it's then got the added task of actually having to try and freeze it. And for a lot of these fridges, they can do it, but it takes a lot of effort in order to do so. So it's better off if you freeze everything before you put it in the fridge. That way, this thing isn't running 24 seven while you're driving down the road, you get to where you wanna set up camp and your dual battery, or in this case, your cranking battery or whatever it may be, is completely stone dead. And then you've gotta leave the car running so you can actually switch it off to go to sleep to make sure that'll actually start first thing tomorrow morning. So. That's, that's one thing I found that works for me. So that's something worth keeping in mind. Now, when you get to where you're camping, there's a couple of things you can do. If you've got a fancy vehicle, you'll have two batteries. But obviously for some of us, you know, is there really a need for dual batteries? Like, I know there is, but it's quite expensive. And if you're only going to use the system two, three times a year, is it really worthwhile? Well, there's a few ways you can actually go about it. When I'm going out bush for a long period of time, I set up a base camp. And if you're going somewhere and you're gonna set up somewhere for a week, it's worthwhile making a base camp. And what you can do is you can just take, it, take a humble car battery with you and just a small little 100 watt solar panel, put it out in the sun, provided you get plenty of sun, depending on what part of the world you're in. and Obviously, by then hooking this up straight onto the battery, you've got the solar panels charging that battery. It'll be more than sufficient to keep this running. Settings on modern day fridges are fantastic. You can set it to high, which means obviously it'll only operate from 13 volts down to 12 volts, or you can set it on the low setting where it'll run the battery right down to 10 volts. Now this is where it gets interesting. If you have one of these fancy fridges in your series Land Rover, you don't necessarily need to worry about a dual battery system because they already come fitted with one. That's right, it's called a crank handle or a starting handle. Because most of these fridges run down to 10 volts, we know that we only need six volts 
to generate a spark. It won't be enough to turn over the starter motor, but we don't need to worry about that because we've got a crank handle. That's right, that's right. This is where the real boys play. So that's one of the advantages of having a starting handle. Now, if you're still very suspect about it, I'd recommend doing this. Take a couple cheap six volt batteries and some small alligator clips and join them in parallel and then hook them onto your coil, the positive and negative terminal on your coil. And that will provide a little bit of a booster to give a good spark and you turn over your crank handle, the land you'll fire into life and you're set for another day. So absolutely perfect. So that's something I'd recommend there. Now, we'll move on to the icebox or the humble esky. Now, many of you probably think, well, there's nothing really to learn about that, but there's always something to learn. Now, this little esky here, it, or I call them eskies due to the brand here in Australia, or you can call them icebox, it's entirely up to you. It's quite cute, it really is. And for out here and for what I'm doing, it's probably a bit small, but I've got a certain sentimental attachment to it. I've had it for a number of years. Now, when I use an esky, I do things a little bit differently. We do a lot of things differently here at Seriously Series, but one of the things I do is I actually make up my own ice blocks. And what I do is I get a plastic sealed container and I fill it full of water about a week or so before I actually go out bush. And I try and get them as big as I possibly can, the containers, so they literally just fit in the bottom of the esky. Now, by making my own large ice block, I'm actually once again reducing the surface area that's exposed to the ambient atmosphere. So by placing, I usually place half a dozen large ice blocks in the esky, it means that ice will actually last for up to one week, a solid block. There'll be a bit of water in the bottom, obviously, but that's pretty impressive. Now, if I get a bag of ice and I put it in there, that, that will probably only last me about two, maybe three days, depending on how hot it is. So making your own ice blocks, one, it saves you money. Yes, it takes a bit of time, but if you prepare things correctly, it's not such a bad thing. Now, as I said, it's a bit of a dainty esky and Obviously, using conventional ice can be a conventional problem of there not being enough room for the beer. Pretty severe. And obviously, the other sustenance that we need to keep us alive. So, I've found a way around it by taking a leaf out of those who've gone before me. What you can actually use, and I've talked about this in a previous episode, uh, or sorry, previous video, is using dry ice. Now, for those of you who don't know, dry ice is the I guess the solid entity of carbon dioxide. And basically, you can get these in a pellet or you can get these in a sheet. Now what you can do is you can lay the sheets or the pellets in the bottom of your esky. And what you then want to do, anything that you want frozen, like your meat, dairy, butter, whatever, you then put on top. I then put my veggies on top of that and then the beer goes right on top. It'll keep the beer at a nice crisp one degree centigrade and it means that you've got easy access. Very important. The meat will freeze. The ice itself, uh, obviously being CO2, it then transfers into a gas, so it just evaporates basically. And the one thing I love about that is you don't end up with this disgusting juice or bin juice in the bottom with your butter and your eggs floating around after four days being out bush. So dry ice is definitely the way to go. For an esky of this size, uh, one kilo of dry ice will last about four days. Uh, that'll freeze everything solid like your meat and all the rest, and that acts as an ice block too, which then keeps the esky cool also. So that will give you another probably two days on top of that, so about a week or so. The one kilo of dry ice is about yay big, pretty small. So it means you've actually got more room in your esky for other vital supplies. So anyway, that's just something well worth considering. And really, you know, it all comes down to yourself being able to have the money to get out there to do the adventure that you want to do. 
There's no point getting yourself in crippling debt by buying fancy equipment that you can't use. So if you can afford a fridge, go out there and get one. A particular brand, make and model, I'll leave that up to you. It depends on what you want to do. But the Humble Esky or the Humble Ice Blocks is definitely a must have. You can never go past it. It's the most useful piece of kit I've ever bought. Well, one of the most useful pieces of kit I've ever bought. So anyway, hopefully this video has provided you a bit of food for thought in regards to your own setup in your own four wheel drive. And hopefully there's a few tips and tricks that you've learned here today that you yourself can use on your next adventure. So if you are enjoying the content here at Seriously Series, please do consider checking us out on Patreon by clicking on the Patreon icon at the top right hand corner of your screen. And look, if that isn't your cup of tea, that's entirely fine. All you need to do is check us out at seriouslyseries.com.au and you can support us via PayPal there. And if you're new to the channel, then click on that subscribe button, click on that notification button too. And that way you won't miss out on one single video. Anyway, hope to see you in our next video.